Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. We had a great time on Friday. As I mentioned, the Bible study and the kids were there, and they're such wonderful kids. We have great kids growing up and currently in the church. We thank God for them. And when you see them encourage them, high five them. They love that. And I was surprised that we all sat together at dinner. Someone, one of the adults asked uh, my six-year-old some questions. She breaks down to this conversation. Couldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, she had something on her mind, and she was talking. So you might be surprised. You ask something, and they want to get it out and talk, kind of like us <laughs> in that regard, right? And that's why we're here together, to catch up. Hey, how you been? What's your week look like? Boy, let me tell you, right? Let me, uh, so spend time and and fellowship that way. Catch up with one another when you can. Um, that's what we're all about, really being together as we can, can do that. Well, I don't know what's going on with this. Oh. Okay. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 to the end of the chapter, verse 39, is what our reading will be. Please follow along. But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming shares with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him, for we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Please join me in prayer. Lord, uh, we come now before your word, and I pray that uh, you would teach us and speak to us, Lord. Each of us prepare our hearts to receive your truth. Each of us pre prepare us to walk in that truth, to respond, to uphold that truth, defend it, apply it. God, uh, may your word be planted in our hearts this morning, in our minds. May it be meditated on. May it be challenge us and stir us. And God, I just pray it ultimately will change us. We thank you for the, the message of Hebrews that you have preserved for every generation and for the generation to come. In your name, amen. Just to kind of catch us up on where we are right now uh, as we wrap up this chapter, we looked at uh, in previously verse 19 that uh, God has provided a new covenant, a new and living way through Jesus Christ. Uh, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, we are... No no longer, if we come through Christ, we are no longer hindered to come. We are encouraged to come, to draw near to God. The veil has been torn, and we can now enter beyond the veil into His presence. The way has been made through Jesus Christ. So that, that, that's uh, what Hebrews 10 has uh, shared as we previously looked at. Where does that leave us? The way has been made. Well, that means we must enter that way. We must do it. We must do it uh, and do it with confidence. And we see here in these verses too, do it and persevere in it, endure in it all the way to the end. He made the way to enter. Uh, we, have to, we have to follow into that way. Verse 26 through 31 was a warning if you won't. 
And that's what we looked at specifically last year, that some have heard the truth of Jesus, maybe even claim to be, believe it for a while, but then for whatever reason rejected it. And so they pulled away, they forsook, we saw that word forsook, the faith, the, the, the gathering together. Uh, they went to uh, do it on their own. And we're, what we're seeing here in these verses here that you can now apply to the previous verses is there was heavy persecution and pressure around. So part of the forsaking was I'm, I'm staying away because I don't want to be hunted down, persecuted, put on a list. I don't want anyone knocking on my door. I don't want when I go looking for a job, it's saying here, okay, so I see you identify yourself as a Christian. You are part of this community. Uh, we can't give you the job. So part of, part of what's happening here is that. So this perseverance of the saints is pressing on. And you can look at chapter 6 where the encouragement is to press on. Uh, is very important. You must do it. Just do it. Walk on with the Lord, of course, as he would lead you. Honor him, first and foremost. I remember years ago, we were uh, in Romania during communist times, and we had just met with uh, some friends of ours, friends of my parents, exa more specifically close, close friends. We'd just given them the drop of Bibles. And uh, this was at a time when Bibles, you weren't allowed to have a Bible. Bibles were not available to purchase. Christian material was unheard of, uh, would get you in trouble if you had. So here's this couple, and they, uh, they met, and he took a bag of Bibles. And we met them away from their home, and he was to walk home with these Bibles, store them at his place, and then give them out to believers to have their own copy or to anyone who was becoming a Christian. And he said that he took the corner, when he took the corner on his street to his apartment block, two policemen were waiting at the entrance. And they set their sights on him. What, what would you do at that moment? You got a bag of Bibles that'll get you in trouble. Two policemen are waiting for you. Now they see you and they're looking at you. What do you do? <laughs> yeah. You turn away, you're in trouble. Uh, you, you hesitate, you get stopped for questions, right? And he just kept going. He just kept going like he didn't have a care in the world, like he was just carrying a bag of whatever. And he walked right through those two policemen right in the middle with confidence. And the Lord granted him success that day. And that, that, that's the idea, that you don't forsake, that you don't turn away, that you keep, uh, keep going on the way that we're called. The idea of forsaking a community of faith today uh, is something that is a reality. There's different schools of thoughts on this. There's different uh, surveys on this. I think he should be taken with a grain of salt. People say, you know, in general, in our country, people are dropping away from church because they're becoming more atheist, more agnostic. Uh, the other way to look at that, uh, there's evidence that there are beliefs out there that are capturing people's hearts. People are turning to a belief or a belief system because we were made to relate to God, to find peace with him and purpose in this world purpose for our lives. So people are turning to belief, but it is devoid of community. We see it all around us. Today, there's a mistrust of institutions, any institutions, especially this younger generation. Uh, they have a relaxed attitude toward any institution, job, marriage, government, etc. People's ideas and ideals would be, if, if you would leave it up to them, is they would want an unscheduled, untethered life, right? Doing random things, it taking, seizing the opportunity. Who wouldn't want that, right? Who wouldn't want an unscheduled, untethered life if you could choose that? That's the ideal that's out there. Uh, but even more to the culture that we're in, the spirit of the time that can even influence Christians is the way 
that things are presented. Think about this. Here's a, here's a slogan or an idea that you might have come across. Organized religion is bad. Inner spirituality is good. Now, on the face of it, that sounds, oh, yes, that, that, that's, you know, even some Christians might say that's good. Organized religion, we don't want to be about that. We, uh, we even say we have a slogan in the church, too. It's not a religion. It's a what? Relationship. Relationship with Christ. So this is out there. But the, 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 the second half, that acceptance of inner spirituality is good. Yes, it's good. But it's not the whole truth. Inner spirituality, devoid of community, is not backed up by the Bible. Right? So our faith we see, and what we've seen so far in Hebrews, is it survives together. It can only survive together. The weakest Christian among us is stronger than a Christian alone, on his own. We survive together. That's part of God's plan as he establish the church, is that we would survive and even thrive together. Uh, we have the Apostles' Creed. It's in our uh, hymnal here, that w w one of the earliest creeds, when there was the, the church, the church universal as we know it, and one of the tenets there, it says, we believe in the Catholic Church. At that point, that was there wasn't anything else but the universal church of Jesus Christ. God instituted the church. And um, our faith here is tied to a community of faith. Uh, and it's tied, as we saw last week, it's tied to faith, hope, love, and service in Christ. These are the pillars, Christ being the foundation. We see, too, that the spirit of the age is an influence, but Satan is an influence. We saw uh, this. The enemy is out there. Satan, Jesus... Uh, is waiting too until his enemies be become a footstool at his feet. So, so the pressure uh, the enemy wants to destroy. What's he attacking? Institutions, marriage, church, and so on. So what is the answer to this? Well, Matthew sixteen eighteen, when Jesus tells Peter, Peter, uh, on this rock I will build my church, right? Matthew 16, 18 says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against this. Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So the church is, is the answer, is of God, and those who turn away from their faith, we saw there's a terrifying expectation of judgment. Uh, if you reject the, the faith and the church, if you reject the only sac available sacrifice for sins, there is no longer a means for forgiveness, and judgment is then certain. So Paul has been very direct up to this point, very bold and honest with them. Jesus is your only Savior. You must trust in Jesus. You will be judged if you don't. So here in these verses we see this from warning, he goes into an appeal, into encouragement. And uh, it, while kind of addressing the specific problems that, that the, this congregation is facing, the congregation has been suffering, and by all accounts, it will continue. And we saw the kind of suffering that they, endu they endured. Um, you accepted joyfully, verse 34, the seizure of your property, knowing that uh, you, you sympathize with prisoners, you were reproached, you suffered, you faced tribulations, and you became sharers in that tribulation. So the way the church will be victorious, God has said, is the gates of hell will not prevail. Being part of the church uh, is, in, is key to that. And the second part is personal endurance. Endurance, which we see in this passage. Um, suffering is happening. Suffering will continue. But you must press on. You must endure. Um, <coughs> so how, what are we to, um, to see to this? 
that if we have made a confession of Christ, if we are gathered together, if we are in one faith in Christ, we have to understand, too, that there is coming a day, if it hasn't come already, where we will face pressures, face sufferings, where we are proclaiming faith, we are speaking of faith, but one day we'll have to put our money where our mouth is, to use an expression, right? We will have to speak for the faith, defend the faith, and live, live with that result, live with the pressure and consequence of that result. So our response is, is critical. Endurance is not optional here. Paul's saying you have to endure to the end. If you don't have endurance, your faith isn't real. It doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter where you've been, what experience you, you hold on to. You must endure. And so Paul, in, in some ways, is say, he's saying, I'm, I've, I've got questions about your faith. I'm concerned, but I think you will end well. Why do I think you will end well? Because you started well. Verse 32, remember the former days. Verse 32, remember the former days. This constant, make it a habit. Return to the former days. What you had was real. You had faith in Christ. You, ex- you have accepted Christ. Uh, and you, th- you saw the fruit of that. You saw the fruit of joy in the midst of suffering. You, endure, you endured then great conflicts of suffering. This, com- this uh, decision that you had to accept Christ um, helped you actually endure. Yes, part of that problem is upholding Christ brings in conflict. But it, Christ is your answer for enduring that conflict. Jesus was crystal clear in Matthew 10, when he said, you will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end will be saved. One who endures to the end will be saved. So we must have endurance. And the writers here, is, uh, Paul, is, is pleading with them, pleading with us, that when that day comes, hold fast, endure. Have courage and endure. So remember your confidence. Uh, remember the former days after being enlightened, when you had Jesus, when you accepted Jesus. He is the true light, John 1, 9 says. He is the light, the true light that enlightens every man. This is the enlightenment that you had. Hold on to Jesus. This is not just uh, an experience at church. You came and visited. You saw. You don't have just knowledge of these things. You were enlightened. You truly were enlightened. Um, in in uh, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, it sa- he says there too about enlightened. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good, the wor- good word of God and the powers of the age to come, I- and then fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since ag- they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. So in short, these people who know the truth, uh, we don't know if they are generally saved or not until they persevere to the end. If you are enlightened, you will endure. Now, because they were enlightened, they, they endured, they were willing to suffer publicly. Um, what kind of... Uh, Suffering did they go through? Reproaches and tribulations. People came after them, attacked them. Uh, Does anyone like to be singled out and humiliated? No. Does anyone like to be called out and made fun on Facebook? No. Anyone like to be the butt of anyone else's jokes? Probably not. But these are the reproaches that they faced. These are the, the tribulations, the trials. And these people willingly endured, it says. When they decided to draw closer to Jesus, their entire community labeled them as the biggest fools alive and publicly sought to humiliate them. So the world here we see, just like in our day, has an opinion about what we think and believe and then wants to make it known and then acts on that their opinion. 
But they suffered, uh, not only publicly, they suffered deliberately. And we see that. Look what it says in the second half of verse 33. Partly by becoming shares with those who were so entreated. They accepted the suffering of their brother or sister and they partook in it. They said, we will stand with you. No one likes this. It's happening to my brother. I'm going to stand with him. Uh, <coughs> this shows that this is genuine faith in Christ. True, genuine endurance and genuine confidence. This is not that they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They went and submitted themselves to this reproach with their brother and sister. They signed up for scorn and persecution because their brother and sister in Christ suffered. They were partakers. In other words, they were sharers. They chose to suffer on purpose. And they suffered joyfully. We see in verse 34. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully. Joyfully the seizure of property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Who would, if someone knocked on your door and said, would, we're taking all you have, who would accept that seizure joyfully? If someone walked into this church and said, okay, we're taking over, this is our place now, you all get out. Who would accept that joyfully? We see here it says, remember those days you accepted it joyfully. How? Why? Well, why is in the second half of that verse, 34, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. They could sign up for suffering and rejoice because they had confidence in what they had that couldn't be taken away. There's that confidence. They believe that Jesus had said, Matthew 19, verses 27 through 29. Peter said to Jesus, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or, or farms for my sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. So they knew their loss of things on this earth, but they also knew those things couldn't compare to what Jesus had said and promised. Uh, this only signified, if I'm going to lose everything for Jesus. This is a sign to Jesus that I'm pressing on, that I'm holding firm to the way, and that I, I will live for, for Christ and how he leads me. This, this signifies the gain of the things in heaven when you lose everything on earth. For Christ and they were able to rejoice in that they rejoiced so they took Jesus at his word too and and what he said he's promised uh, and this is the secret to suffering this is the secret to suffering holding on to Christ honoring him in the midst of our world helps us endure and even still have joy holding on to his promises of and reward Paul says uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's the secret that Paul is saying it, you must have this to uh, suffering, and that's these people. That, that's the people that Hebrews is describing about. Remember, Paul says, the former days. In short, remember what you did, why you did it, how you did it. Ponder on that. Go back to that. You didn't just suffer because you couldn't get away. You signed up for it, and... When it happened, you weren't distraught. You were actually rejoicing. 
That's the, the work of faith and confidence. That, and that's how you started. Remember that. So we come to this point in verse 35 where he says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Don't throw that away. He doesn't say don't set it aside. Don't put it over here. He says don't throw it away. In other words, don't trash it. Don't throw it away. Um, <clears throat> confidence here is the word parasia, which literally means all speech. It's uh, spoken of a person who could speak freely and speak boldly. A courageous person uh, who maybe had a problem of speaking up, but he now has the courage, speaks boldly. Right? In Acts 4.31, it says, When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Ephesians 6.19, Paul says, Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Also, 1 Thessalonians 2.2 2 says, But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God among much opposition. This confidence, he's, he's not talking just about a quiet assurance that you have, that you feel confident in your faith and in Christ. He's talking about standing up and speaking. It means to speak out with boldness and being bold. So uh, <clears throat> they were bold. That's how they began. They were courageous. They spoke out for Jesus amidst a, a lot of opposition, a lot of public rejection, reproach, dismissal, and they were outnumbered when they spoke. And some of the brothers and sisters looked really, really bad in, in their neighborhood and at work. But they didn't sit idly by and watch their brothers and sisters suffer. Isn't that a beautiful picture? They raised their hands and joined in. I'm going to join you, brother and sister, and I'm not ashamed. So he says here, don't throw that away. Don't throw away that boldness. Why? Well, what does the second half of verse 35 say? It has what? Great reward. It has great reward. God rewards that type of conviction and faith and boldness and confidence. Matthew 11, 5, 11 and 12 says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God re rewarding this type of boldness and confidence. He says in verse 36, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. You have need of endurance. That word there for endurance means to bear up under courageously. To bear whatever you're facing with courageous. So take your confidence and courage and endure. He's going to say in verse, uh, in chapter 12, later on, verse 2, be focused on Christ. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, and he uses this word endurance, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, uh, what Jesus did in regard to the cross, what did he do to suffering? The cross, the ultimate expression of suffering. What does he do? He endures it, doesn't he? He endures it boldly, with courageously. Uh, and so, Paul's saying, you need that type of courage now. You need that type. Don't throw away your confidence. And you need, it says, you need... Uh, this endurance, the courage that will allow you to continue to do the will of God. 
the curves that will allow you to receive what was promised. You've got to hold on to your boldness and be courageous. So, don't let it go. Stand up and be bold for Christ. Uh, <clears throat> in verses 37 through 38, For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my, righteousness, my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. He's trying to help them muster up this courage and reminding them to be alert. Satan would want nothing better than for us to give up and fold and, and leave and, and try to fend for ourselves, depart from the faith community, and then ultimately just leave the faith. Um, and we, we remember in um, when the parable of, of that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 10 when he calls us uh, sheep and the wandering sheep and the wolf. He promises that uh, he, th the shepherd will defend us from the wolf, even though there are wolves in our midst. If we are persecuted, uh, the sh shepherd, we can always turn to the shepherd. So just at that moment when we're ready to give up, when they're ready, they're, they're, their confidence is waning, turn to Christ. In a very little while, he who is coming will come. Jesus will come back. Jesus will defend us. Jesus will gather his flock. He will not delay. We saw this point too earlier of uh, there is only a t the time for drawing near is at hand. So draw now with confidence. Join the way. In verse 28, it says, uh, in, third, uh, in Matthew 28, it says, Do not fear who will kill the body but is unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And we saw that this judgment that he's coming, he's either coming, in Hebrews it says, as our Savior or as our judge. There is... Uh, judgment in verse 30 for he we know him who said vengeance is mine I will repay and again the Lord will judge his people the Lord will judge his people when he comes will he judge or is he coming to rescue and to save us so let us consider uh, how to stimulate one another one another in love verse 24 and good deeds. Let's not forsake our ways, verse, our, uh, verse, our assembling, verse 25, together, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another. Whoever is weak, whoever needs encouragement, uh, be there for one another. We're called to encourage one another. All the more as you see the day drawing near. Uh, we are not to be those who shrink back. We are not to shrink back. We're to stand, and we stand so much better together. Uh, we, our faith is kindled together. We grow together in the faith, in the persevering of our soul. When we get to chapter 11, we're going to see a lot of different examples of faith. Now that we're done with 10, we're, we're ending a chapter where Paul gives example after example after example of different people who walked with in faith, and they faced all kinds of, of trials, and we see that some of them were murdered, some of them were persecuted heavily, some of them lost everything. So this, this chapter ends uh, with the secret to suffering, and we, we're then given examples of people, a larger community of people in the faith who suffered but did not shrink back, did not shrink back. And that's my prayer for us, that we will have this courage to speak up, to be bold. We will have the kind of faith that steps out. It's, it's a personal faith uh, that puts us on our way with Christ, but then together we have this corporate faith, this faith to have courage more in number, 
to be together and to be uh, an ever witness of light and hope and of, of our way that we have chosen, standing together, sharing together, even in suffering. When one suffers, we all suffer. Uh, we have a common faith and our, a common promise and destination through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and we, we acknowledge that we need your endurance, we need your confidence. Lord, uh, we are living in a, cu uh, a culture that is trying to do things on their own. And we, you've instituted the church. You've given us personal faith and corporate faith. Lord, we're living in a country that is so blessed with so many uh, creature comforts and so many things at our fingertip and our disposal that we could so easily pull away in the name even of spirituality, of just finding our path alone. But you've already said you, that you have created a new way for us, a new and living way that you inaugurated as you opened up a path of salvation and you have instituted the church. The church here is instituted because of the great community of faith, worship, and service that you had planned for every generation. The church will not go away. Satan will not defeat the church. We have victory. So help us not to shrink back. Help us to be the church. We are the body of Christ. Every member to be a, the church and represent you in this community, in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces. Help us to stand together when one is reproached. And we, Lord, believe, as your word says here, that true faith in the body uh, will allow us to count on others that will stand with us when we're going through trials, when we're going through suffering. Help us, Lord, endure, as it says here, for a little while, that you are coming, and you will come and save and rescue. Until you do, Lord, keep us on our way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.